I thought I'd start with some FAQs today. I get um, a lot of questions about my job and being in the NFL side of the business, so I thought I'd just start with those so we can concentrate on the marketing and uh, sales components. Do I do anything during the off season? Yes, we work. Uh, 365 days a year, Lambeau Field is a 365 day a year destination. It's really one of our more busy times in the front office as we're working on budgets, reviews, things like that. Do you hang out with the players? I'm really old. They don't want to hang out with an old lady. So um, no, I don't really hang out with the players, um, but the coaches are more my age, so I, I feel like I probably have a closer connection with them. How did I get my job? I interviewed like everybody else, um, worked really hard to get there, and uh, just a note of advice, nothing comes easy. So what was your degree in? It was a communication major. Uh, I was a communication major. That's my uh, degree. And I went to the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh for my undergraduate program. And I'm currently going for my master's. And I graduate in seven weeks at Oshkosh as well. But who's counting? <laughs> School I covered. What advice do you have for me to get into sports marketing? I would say if you're interested in sports marketing, start early with your current college and work in the athletic department. Look to get internships. That's a key we always look at in terms of professional sports, that you have a passion about sports and that you have been involved in some sort, sort of sports uh, connection. And then I do a lot of presentations for high schools. They come to the stadium to experience our stadium tour. And also, um, they go to our Hall of Fame. And then we have a speaker. And so a lot of times, it's marketing classes. So I speak to them. Any, any guesses on what their favorite question is? Anybody? Yes. Who's your favorite player? Who, who's, who's my favorite player? And nope, that's not it. How much money do I make? So <laughs> that we won't be covering. But um, you know what our players make, and I don't make that. So you're, you're all set. So. My turn to ask the questions. How many Packers fans do we have? I'm sorry, I can't see the online viewers. Good. Um, and then uh, just for those online, I would say it would be at least 75% of this room that holds roughly 400, maybe. And then um, second question is, how many Bears fans are there in the audience? Um, I would say there's, there's probably about, maybe about 30 Bears fans. And you can leave, so thanks so much for coming. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. We're fans of all sports, and ironically, in the NFL, you, you, there's tough competition on the field, but off of the field, we share information all the time. What's working for your social program? How are you advancing content? How are you selling this? What are you doing with your ticket program? How are you um, capitalizing on visitors that come to the stadium? We have uh, league meetings that we go to, and we share all this information, and that's, that's pretty cool, I think. So. Um, so then and now, I want to get into a little bit about the history of the Green Bay Packers. There's only one line that speaks to the beginning of what we know today. And that headline appeared in, on August 13th of 1919. And that headline read, Indian Packing Plant Squad to Represent City. The article was about seven paragraphs long. And it just said that the, they were going to have a subsequent meeting on Thursday about this new inner squad team that was going to be developed. That is the building where it took place, courtesy of the uh, photo of the Neville Public Museum. It was held in the Green Bay Press Gazette. That's the local paper in Green Bay, their office building. So that was the, the very first meeting. And this was the very first team. This is our one and only photo that we have. And you can see that's not quite the roster we have these days. So um, that takes us back a little bit to our roots. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about our today's game plan, and which is historical and present, historical and the present in terms of marketing. So I did pull up some old ads that we can all review and have some fun with. But I thought first I'd talk a little bit about uh, brand and marketing today and talk a little bit about the department in which I work. We cover various things across our uh, department, the first one being web ad placement. We, we place hundreds of millions of ads on Packers.com, which is our main website, and we have a team of people who do that. They do um, all of the reports, all the analytics with that. So when you talk about marketing, it's more than just you know, 
what you traditionally think is marketing is maybe creative or copywriting and things like that. We have a lot of analytics people on our team that really are the back end movers and shakers and help us understand what's performing well, what our best practices are, things like that. Packers everywhere, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So one of the things we don't have is we don't have tickets to sell. So we are challenged constantly with trying to get people to experience our brand who may never come to our stadium. We have a broad, very broad fan base footprint, and so we created this platform. It's, very, it's digital in nature, but we also have off-site activations in which we travel on road games and we host pep rallies the day before a game day. So I'll show you a little video on that and show you what that's been doing in the marketplace for us. Analytics, which I, t I spoke about as well, that dovetails a little bit off of our web placement. Also our analytics team, we have a business intelligence manager, and he is responsible for helping sales with new pitches. He will do all the research on Comscore and things like that to understand you know, what percentage of our fans is most likely to go on a cruise? What percentage of our fans is most likely in the market to buy a Chevy truck? So we uh, take everything we do seriously and we all, always back it up with research when it comes to selling and sponsorship. The next component, I thought I clicked it, there it is, our Wi-Fi experience. So right now we have a team called Feed, which is fans, fans enhanced electronically something, I don't, know. I don't know what it stands for. But anyway, what we try to do is make your experience really great when you're at the stadium. So we're doing a lot of testing with iBeacons and also push notifications and we're constantly examining what we can do to make your visit when you're at the stadium a little bit more uh, pleasant, a little bit more informational driven um, and make it an overall great guest experience. Fan clubs is something we also do. We have an adult and a kids club. The adult is $100, the kids is uh, $20, so um, won't talk a lot about that, but as far as research, we do a ton of research. I'll touch on that just a little bit today. And um, in terms of game day research, if you go to a game and you get sent an email or you um, see an ad on our website for a concert that we have may, maybe had at Lambeau Field or most recently we hosted the Wisconsin Badgers and LSU Tigers at Lambeau Field. So we do a bunch of research on that. The league also does research and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the league benchmarks us on and you might find that interesting. Creative services rounds us out as well. So we do a lot of our creative internally. I'll show you some of that today. and. Um, we have two graphic designers on staff and then we do outsource some things once in a while. And then last and certainly not least is our CDW which is our basically our customer data warehouse or essentially sending emails. And I'm going to touch a little bit on that today as well. But that's what makes up our specific brand and marketing department. It's not the same everywhere in the league or in professional sports. That's just how we're put together. And so when you boil it down it comes to three things that we work on and that's fan acquisition. We want to get as many fans as we can within our footprint and market to them successfully. The research and analytics component and then the creative services. So I thought I'd cover just quickly, again this is the now part, our department objectives. The first one is to increase audience reach and depth and I think that visual kind of shows it if you're familiar with the Lambo Leap. What we want to do is get as many reach as many people as we can with multiple layers of touches and we want to keep them a fan for life. So that's really our goal, uh, one of our main goals and strategies when we look at whatever we put out in the public. Is this helping increase audience? Is this going to help retention? Are these people going to be coming back? Next, our next goal is be a resource for internal stakeholders and that's kind of how we see ourselves drying off Aaron Rodgers' helmet. So we uh, market uh, five different businesses within the, besides the main business of football, we, we also market um, to our shareholders, our season ticket holders, and then our five main business units, which are the Hall of Fame. We have a stadium tour section. We have events. You can get married at Lambeau Field. You can host a conference at Lambeau Field. We have a, a, a pro shop, and also we have a restaurant inside Lambeau Field. So we're also responsible for marketing all of those. We help them with everything from creative to emails to ads um, and their overall planning. And then last but certainly not least, we want to deliver on the brand promise in unique, compelling and relevant ways. And our brand promise is really about 
being, you know, being delivering excellence in every touch point that we can. And when we talk about unique, re relevant, and compelling ways, one of the things we did last year, you might find this a little bit fun. I don't talk about it too much um, because of the nature of it, but what we decided to do was a surprise and delight campaign. So instead, you know, we get a lot of calls and emails and social posts from people who are looking for you know, donations, or, which is fine, and, um, or like, a, my, my brother is a huge fan, can you help, can you do something with him? So instead of us you know, looking at those, we went out and searched fans out. We had one gal who loved Randall Cobb so much, so we had our, all of our interns stock people and, and large fans. We had, a, we had one fan who was such a huge Randall Cobb um, advocate, she, she had a, a cape that was made that said Randall Cobb and her office cubicle was all decked out. And by the way, he's a receiver on our team for you Bears fans. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so what we did is we, we said, hey Randall, we got a huge fan. Would you mind um, putting a note together for her? So we, we had him wear, a, we, had a, we have custom jerseys made in the pro shop, so we, we had him wear a custom jersey that had her name on it and took a picture, wrote a note. We also, we did, we did a ton of those things throughout the year and we wanted it to be organic. We didn't want to have a huge, um, you know, campaign around how great this was. We wanted it to be simply organic and then it would spread word of mouth and we had a huge success with that. So um, that's one example of that. So I thought we'd get into a little bit of then and the history of our logo. The one you see today is the one you may have only seen. <coughs> So um, one question we get, and is it true that in our 1960 championship against Phil Philadelphia, the most famous Packers G was not on the helmet? And that's true. Um, during Lombardi's five championships, the, um, the Packers um, wore a different shape logo than you see today. And that logo, the, the first time that logo was shown, and you can see it's a little bit different. You can see it on number 78. It's more oval shaped. And that, this photo is from the very first time they wore it, and that was August 5th, 1961. And you'll see just an examination of that logo right here. You can see it's a little bit more football shaped. And you know, people ask, when did it phase in from the top to the bottom? And you know, we aren't really sure. At that time, our team historian feels that they wouldn't get new helmets every year. So they think as soon as a newer player came in, they, they phased in the new um, logo. So how it was developed was Dad Brazier at the time was the equipment manager, and he had this idea of what to sketch, and he connected with his assistant, who was an art student going to St. Norbert College, and that art student's name was John Gordon. And he is the one who did the sketch of the G as you see it. Um, so this, uh, this, the new logo, which is below and our current one, happened at about 1970 is when we can verify that it was, it was throughout the photo archives in which we can see. Um, and ironically, that's this just fun fact, the same year the NFL started putting names in the back of jerseys. So you can see you know, um, promotion happening. This is another question we often get, you know, the chicken and the egg question. So this is the, this is the Georgia uh, G, and people ask, how did this happen? How are these two logos so much alike? And you can see um, they're a little bit different, not only in color, but a little bit in shape as well. So ours certainly was, you know, um, stemmed from that football shape. And then Georgia, in the story that they tell, which we don't have anything to refute it, oops, sorry, there's a delay and I don't think, okay. We don't have anything to refute it, so we tend to go with their story. So the Georgia team, uh, their athletic director wanted to go with a logo similar to the Packers. So in 1964, they called us and said, hey, do you mind if we you know, use a, a similar logo? Apparently we gave the blessing and then, um, but ours was, did not look like this at the time. Ours looked like the sketch at the time. And so Georgia's statement was, they liked ours so much, they shaped you know, their logo like ours then. So there's, that's, that's the story on the, lo on the G logo for Georgia. But over time, let's take a look at the logos in their current shape. And I think it's kind of interesting. And it's not just logos, some are just words, some are just marks. 
um, and interesting in how it evolved over time. So that's kind of the first uniform that you would see in the first really nomenclature or type treatment that you would see, um, followed by the 50-53 season. And, um, that there was also a stock sale then. So if you have a, if someone in your family has a stock that has that logo on it, that's pretty big time because they're rare. Then in 54 to 61, it's the state of Wisconsin and the player, kind of a complicated logo. Then it got a little bit more simplistic with the overlaid G's and B's, but you can see the G's starting to sh take shape also during that time. Um, you can see the back of, I think it's Lombardi, I'm not sure, the back of his jacket also had that type treatment. And at the same time, we were also using um, kind of a different shape of the, of the player with the state in the football. And then that's when the G in the football shape happened and then to the current G that we know today. So when I started, um, with the Packers, not everything had the same look and feel. And um, when even you go back in history, you know, years ago, you can see all those logos, all the different brands we were wearing. Now everything in our department has a branded constant look and feel, and that's something we strive to do every year. So you'll see everything from our concession signage. Um, you'll see the striping theme. It's also on our tickets. It's uh, throughout the building on general wayfinding signage. Any ads that we do have the striping. Um, social media, you'll see it on game day. You'll also see it in stadium on our roster card, on our trend revision scoreboards. So it's really important that we keep a branded look and feel so that, you know, a lot of people try to imitate us and copy us. So we, we try to stay with one look and feel throughout the season. Um, I have a little fun interjections of photo perspectives then and now, and this is one of them. So this was our team photo early on, and then this is a little more dated, but you can see it takes a village. You can look at the, the difference um, in roster sizes. So just to um, take, and also coaching staff. So marketing then, a little bit about that time period. This is a poster that, you know, at, believe it or not, at one time we had to sell tickets. So I'm gonna go through um, that, and we are, I don't mean that in a braggadocious way, I, we're very fortunate that we do not have to, have to be in that, but um, predicament. So this is a poster, and the, this was a common sort of marketing um, tactic that was done in the days where we needed to sell tickets. Oh, I don't know what that is. There, that's good, that's gone. It's a bear attack. It's a bear attack, cyber attack from the Chicago Bears. But you can see, um, you know, just as you zoom in on this, no one writes like this. It is always a battle royale when these two teams meet. They have been gridiron enemies for years. Then and now, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Um, it will be one of the class, football classics of 1930. Don't miss seeing it. You know, so what does that tell you? There's still a call to action. They're trying to, you know, they're writing marketing content that is trying to get you to take an action. Here's another one. Chicago Cardinals at the time, and um, City Stadium, which is, I think, our second stadium we played in. So this poster, get your, get your tickets early, um, and they spent a lot of money to round up a winner, and they, they are advertising stars from the Chicago team, which I thought is interesting, because I don't think we would ever, you know, advertise um, other teams' players. Oops and then and also creating additional value. So see them and don't miss out. I thought we'd talk a little bit about our tickets, uh, that we don't currently have anything to sell, but um, let's talk about when we did have time, in, there was a time when we did sell them. Um, so you can see Packer season tickets now, and you'll notice we don't call it Packer. Everything's plural, it's Packers, so I think that's pretty interesting. The best home schedule in the NFL, orders for single game tickets will not be fulfilled until two weeks before each game. Avoid disappointments, buy season tickets now. Again, a lot of call to action, a lot of, and I think it's just interesting, it's all type treatment. Um, ticket sales, 1948, 60 days till Christmas. Wondering what to buy, stop worrying. Um, the gift of a lifetime, available now with a handsome grading card. <laughs> so, it's a big deal. You get a handsome greeting card. 
So that was, um, you know, know thy audience. So the woman at, in, at home, probably at the time, was the person buying um, the tickets. So that's who the demographic is. But I do find it funny down below. It says, gentlemen, enclosed find my money order for $10 per ticket. But, you know, they were different times. This is um, a Green Bay plays a, uh, played at the time a handful of games in Milwaukee during um, history, and now I'll play all their games at Lambeau Field, but those of you who might not know, we did have some Milwaukee games. And um, I thought this was interesting. This was in the 70s, so we worked with um, a company, a travel service, and you could see the Packers versus 49ers for $349. And it was a five-day day trip by jet, which includes Las Vegas. So I thought that was kind of fun and interesting. Oops. So this is from 1958. The Packers set a goal of 10,000 season tickets um, to go on sale in Milwaukee. So I'll just read a little snippet of this uh, just to kind of give you the flavor of how tickets were sold. This is an article that appeared in the newspaper in 1958. Uh, Chair Chairman Robert Curley and 40 workers got together at the stadium for an organizational medium, meeting. The di Milwaukee directors of the Packers have already contacted 150 of the largest local industries. And you'll know today we have a ton of still strong business relationships, even from back in that time. If Milwaukee wants to be on, this is a quote, if Milwaukee wants to be on par with the rest of the league, we should average 30,000 of our two league games this season, said the ticket director of the Packers. The season ticket sale here is already around 7,000, and if the 10,000 mark is reached, it will be the first time the Packers have done this well in Milwaukee. So I think that's, that's pretty telling. And then the article goes on. Uh, Vern Llewellyn, Packers GM, said Wednesday that orders for the Bear game tickets are oversubscribed, and the ticket office is no longer accepting orders for the Bears game. Again, then and now, still the same. Um, and the last line is tickets are available for all other games in Green Bay and Milwaukee. So completely different times. So let's talk about a little bit of today. And this is the worst example because it's hard to see. But I'll tell you about it. And this is all the professors will hate this because this is I grabbed this off of Wikipedia. So this shows you that you can't trust everything uh, that you see on Wikipedia. But this kind of gives you a um, the year Suppose that the year the waiting list was started, ours was 1960, which is correct. Number on waiting list, which is incorrect, we are about 135,000. Um, approximate wait time, we have 955 years. Um, I don't know, I, I didn't do the math nor the algorithm. So, you know, the question is how do you, you know, so. I'll back up a second and say, um, so how, what do we do with this waiting list? So part of our job is to figure out how do we keep these people engaged and how do we keep them, we know they're fans and they're willing to come to our games but can't get a ticket to our games. So we do send out postcards to them annually, just verifying their address, letting them know what priority they are. And, um, oh, I, I blew that one. I told you how many there were. Um, and also, if you see that green bar at the bottom for you Packers fan, occasionally a limited number of single game tickets are available. So we do send the t season ticket holder waiting list if there are available tickets. They do get an email with, from us with the, the chance to purchase at times. So that's a nice little secret. But, so how do you get in front of your customers regarding tickets if we don't have tickets to sell? We collect data and promote tickets in other ways. So, for example, through our Packers Everywhere platform, we have an Enter to Win contest where you can upload your photo and uh, fans vote on the top five, and then whoever is the winner gets their tickets on next year's season tickets. So they get one game, which is the fan appreciation game, which is the last game, home game in December. Um, so that's how we try to, you know, still get in front of people. Um, we do sponsored giveaways with tickets. We do sweepstakes. A great way for us to increase the level of names that are on our current list. Also, you'll notice there's co-branding. There's Pro Packers Pro Shop gift card. So we try to work in our business units wherever possible. An enter to win package with Levi. Again, we did some co-branding with our restaurant in the Hall of Fame. But also, this is these are ways that our fans are able to 
get a chance to win and that you know we're at least opening up the opportunity for people uh, to go to the game. So a lot of those that I just spoke about were emails in our, in our customer data warehouse and I'll talk a little bit about that. We have multiple lists and buckets that we stick fans into. So if you sign up, you can go to Packers.com and sign up for our e-newsletter. But our buckets include the Packers Pro Shop, which is all of the retail arm, e-news, which is twice weekly during the season. And it, what it does is it gives you snippets of video, uh, social, uh, articles, photo galleries, and it's pushed to you uh, twice a week during the season. Like I mentioned, we have sponsor emails. We have events, uh, we have season ticket holders, and then our Packers Everywhere list. Surprisingly, the smallest list, you wouldn't guess, but are, is season ticket holders. Um, there's about 36,000 of them. We have two packages, green and gold, which I won't get into, but that's the reason we have um, so many on the list, even though it's the smallest of the list. Um, we always try to grow this list, and um, the biggest lists are the Packers Pro Shop which um, are roughly hover, hover around a million, or a million uh, fans on the list. So any guesses, a show of hands, how many emails do you think we send a year? Raise your hand if you think it's 90 million. Raise your hand if you think it's 100 million. Raise your hand if you think it's 200 million. Okay, we got for those uh, watching digitally, we get a handful of people that answer. And then how many think it's over 200 million emails a day? Well, you guys are smart cookies. We send about 256 million emails um, a year, and it continues to grow. And if you're signed up for our email system, you might think they all go to you, but they do not. We watch that very closely to make sure people are not oversaturated. We watch the opt-out rates, everything you can imagine. So this is a then and now. I, um, I just wanted to show you, this is more recent, but you know the old template, this is a stock template we have for fans. We give them 10% off for their birthday. And we did, you know, we, we said, we, this email isn't performing very well. What do we need to do? Can we make a better connection to football? And how can we include, increase the click-through rate? So the new template, you can see it's a lot more visually appealing. There's actually a real photo in there. It's directly related to football. A really bigger, stronger call to action. And the results from the template, uh, the new template had a 53% increase in click-through rate. So that's, that's a little then and now. Those are the types of things that we continually try to improve on within our department. And with our business intelligence team, they an analytics team, they review all the open rates, click-through rates, unsubscribes, new emails to the data database. We're always trying to get new fans into the top of the funnel. That's our number one goal. Also subject line testing. So what we do is we'll have a subject line A and a subject line B. And what we do is we'll send out emails in batches. So we'll send, you know, 100,000 out first and then whatever subject line does the best, we'll push you know, the other 750,000 or whatever the list is out with the most popular subject line. We also do the same thing with creative testing. So we'll have a different image in one and a different another, and whatever performs better, we will send the rest of the list that creative. And that's a little bit about creative testing. This is just a fun snippet about our programs. <laughs> so these were older programs. Obviously, they were very thin. I didn't bring any with me because they are locked away in our Hall of Fame. But the outside was four color, inside was you know black and white. And then you can compare it to now. Full color, high speed, a lot of sponsorship, a lot of ads, a lot of content, very thick, and also price differential, of course. So then in now Lambeau Field. Um, this is not Lambeau Field. This is Old City Stadium. It opened in 1925 uh, with a capacity of 5,700 people. It ended with it had an ending capacity of 20, around 25,000 people. This is how you see uh, Lambeau Field um, in its more current state. But on the upper left-hand side, that's when Lambeau Field was first built, and it was in 1957. Um, the capacity at that time was 32,000, and the land around Lambeau Field. A mere, uh, to, to buy that spot was a mere $73,305. The uh, cost to build the first uh, Lambeau Field in the upper left-hand corner 
was hovered right around a million dollars. So you can imagine um, what a stadium costs today. Um, and then you can see the evolution in the 90s to the right, and also the stadium below the main image is, is a little closer to where it is, but you'll notice in the south end zone, which I have highlighted, we added 7,000 seats, which you can see the kind of the before and after. So that increased our capacity to around 82,000. So this is um, a sign in one of our facilities departments, and I love it. There's only one Lambeau field, let's keep it that way. And it's really an inspirational message, and I'm just going to play you a quick video about our um, something that you, know, you, you, you couldn't pay enough money for. Um, Bob Costas uh, did a little piece, and I'm sorry to the Bear fans, there's going to be a score in there you're not going to like, but please put that aside, and we'll go ahead and kick off this video. Back in Green Bay, where the Packers lead the Bears 42-0 at halftime of Sunday Night Football. You know, when you think about the venues at which NFL games are played, many are impressive, but few are historic. Tonight, we're looking at one of football's exceptions. In its own way, Lambeau is as iconic as any of the most storied and appealing baseball parts. And then there is this remarkable fact. Green Bay is the smallest city with a franchise in any of the four major North American sports. Its population is just over 100,000. Lambeau's capacity, 81,000. Number of consecutive regular season sellouts, 305. Even granted that this is very much a regional franchise, think of what the equivalent would be for the same percentage of Chicago's citizens to file into venerable Soldier Field. Its capacity would have to expand to about two million. And then there's just the feel and atmosphere of Lambeau and its unique connection to this town's sense of itself and its history. So if you've never been here, this belongs on your short list of the sports settings you simply have to be able to say you visited at least once. Put it right there with Churchill Downs, Augusta National, Wimbledon, Fenway, Wrigley, and just a very few others. It's in a special category, pretty close to the perfect place to watch an NFL game. And tonight, things are going perfectly for the Packers and for their fans, up 42-0 at the half. Apologies. Um, so that, that is a, a great nod to the fans and the staff. And, um, you know, when you talk about branding and marketing, that's something, you know, that Money just can't buy a piece like that. So we're, you know, we play that a lot of times in a lot of the presentations and a lot of our organizational meetings. So sponsorship, sponsors are a key uh, strategy for any uh, sports team. I'll talk a little bit about them and a couple of our sponsors, just so you know, everybody looks to change their logo over time. I thought some of these are their key sponsors and they also changed their logo over time. So I thought that was interesting. But you'll notice in some of these early photos, even way back then, in the early um, days of the Green Bay, which will become the Green Bay Packers, you can see Alloway Water and Beverages signage in the background at the playing field. Here is Don Shula and Vince Lombardi with Miller. This was at Milwaukee County Stadium. Um, you can tell by their expressions who won and who lost, by the way. Um, so, and it continues. This is also in Milwaukee County Stadium. You can see Pabst Blue Ribbon. Ironically, this is an early uh, photo of Lambeau Field. And sorry, it's a little blurry, but that's the best I could do. But I didn't see anything here on as far as the, the scoreboard and uh, advertising. However, let's look at the 90s, and you can see there is quite a bit of um, sponsorship. Some of them were on rotator signs, like the Coles, and I think there was Pepsi in there as well. Um, this gets a little further into the 90s. You can see there's a, a replay screen, some colors. There's a sponsorship Coles sign cam, which uh, we still do that today. And then there's another look, a little bit more rudimentary until you get to did, you know, HD, how can you beat it, right? But you can see um, a little less, you know, we have standard partners that are permanently placed on the board, which really cleans it up a little bit. Um, at night, you can see those backlit partners that are stationary are lit up. 
And there's another look. So sponsorship has always been a major part of any sports um, program. And I know here at the AMA, we're thankful for all of our sponsors today as well um, that, that really make events happen. So no matter what we do in any type of format, the keys are really about our audience and message. And that's what we try and focus on. These are all the clients we have in the building and outside of the building. We have shareholders, we have the ticket office, we work with player development, we work with general fans, we work with our digital team, we work with football, security, guest services, the restaurant. So a lot of people need things from us. So our job is to figure out what's the audience, you know, who, who's the audience, what's the message, and how can we help these business units accordingly. When we look at our audiences, we look at three different types, um, mainly as our core buckets. We have the hardcore fan. You can see this lady is ready to roll. The game's not even close to being starting or to, to being kicked off, and she is, she's ready to go. The next one is maybe the more casual fans. You might have your holiday photo um, sent out with, with uh, Packers clothing on. And then we have our displaced fans, fans who want to make that connection, but probably won't get to a game because they don't live here. Um, or maybe they can't get tickets. So how do we connect with those displaced fans? What we look for is tentpole events. We look to invite people to training camp. We have shareholder meetings. We have game day. We have all these different events and we work around promoting these tentpole events in order to capitalize on the different audience segments that we have. And we're always looking for new ways to enhance fan engagement. For example, um, you know, Packers Everywhere. This is a, a platform we developed that's just mainly fan fan based. We have pep rallies that are on site at away locations. We have a, a dedicated website. We have all social media surrounding it. We have a lot of contesting and emails that go out. And I'm going to uh, show you a little bit of a video that kind of talks about the Packers Everywhere platform. <laughs> for example, um, and we, we have these pep rallies. We, we might get anywhere from two to 3,000 people there. Everybody checks in through like an Eventbrite platform or a technology-based platform where we capture their emails. That's all, if they, there's no tickets available, it's first come, first serve, but that's the only way they can enter to win for prizing. So we like that platform a lot. It also helps, it's got a search engine for um, establishments you can watch the Packers game at. So when it talked about bar searches and things like that, um, that's something we also work really hard to do and keep updated for our fans so that we're reaching out to this audience who may not live nearby us um, in other ways than just social. We're making, um, a, making it a complete platform. As far as our audiences in general, um, the next steps we're looking at right now internally are creating personas. So it's not just sticking people in different buckets of they're an e-newsletter uh, bucket or they're a pro shop bucket or they're a events bucket. So we're really trying to deep dive into hardcore fans. What does that mean? What do, what do casual fans want to see in, in uh, anything related to Packer fandom? What does a displaced fan want to see? Well, how do we connect with them? And what sort of content should we offer them? Our transient fans, someone who travels a lot or isn't um, always connected to the team. A second team fan. You know, we have a lot of fans that the Packers are their second favorite team. I live in um, 
Oakland. I like the Raiders, but whenever the Raiders aren't on, I watch the Packers because my dad was a Packer fan. We get a lot of that. So how do we capitalize on fans that it, the Packers maybe are their second favorite team? Familial allegiance fan. Again, this is people like generation. If you if you have a child and you're a Packer fan, you're going to raise your child to be a Packers fan. So there's a lot of fans that we have that way. How do we, you know, create a deeper connection with them? And then bucket list fan. We have fans who just have Lambeau Field on their bucket list. How do we make that connection for them? And how can we make their dreams come true and provide them? with content and deliverables that they're actually interested in. And then we have non-bucket list fan, fans who will come to our uh, building because they have a conference. They might not be a fan at all, uh, but how do we still create a great guest experience for them? So our next step in our audience is to develop personas and groupings for each of these markets and to figure out how to speak to them um, with, and de de deliver content that they actually want. So then, then and now research, I don't have a lot of historical data on research. It really hasn't been as robust as you might think. In the past like six, seven, ten years, it's um, become a lot more of a focus, not only for the league, but for us as well internally. Um, a couple of key things. One thing I can tell you is um, the attendees to our game, females are increasing and males are uh, decreasing. So it's about a 50-50 split. Uh, so I think that's pretty interesting, and it's a lot different in other NFL teams, so I, I find that a little bit fascinating. These are the things that the league benchmarks their research on. Um, the first one, the bell ring, is uh, customer service. How are the ushers? How are the parking attendants? Are you getting your answers or answers to your questions? How is the wayfinding signage? The time clock is for ingress and egress. How long did it take you to get through security? How long did it take you... Um, to get through concessions. You know, timing is everything. How long did it take you to get out, out of the stadium? We actually put cameras on people, people's cars and we time them to see how long it takes to get them out of the stadium. Uh, safety and security, did you feel safe? Um, what was your experience going through the, uh, the walkthrough metal detector? And then of course there is uh, <laughs> transportation, parking lots, things like that. So like, we always get really bad grades on this because people in the from the league come and they're like, yeah, I called for an Uber or I, I texted an Uber, no one came. Well, we have two Ubers in Green Bay, so <laughs> the criteria I think needs to shift a little bit for um, the league maybe when they come visit us. And same for cabs, we don't have a lot of public transportation. We're working with the city on doing some busing initiatives and things like that. Concessions, uh, food and beverage. Ironically in research, you're gonna find this amazing. Um, when we win, the food was hot and the, the, the beer was cold and when we lose, the beer was warm and the food was cold. So. Uh, it, makes, it makes a little bit of difference on concessions and if we won or lost. Uh, the fireworks is game day entertainment. Did we show fantasy scores? Did you like the music? Did you appreciate the fireworks? What did you think of the national anthem? We're graded on that. And then last, we're uh, graded on apparel and retail um, components. So that's a little bit about our research. So, you know, we have a lot of game day satisfaction surveys, satisfaction versus expectation. You know, covers in-game technology, how did your Wi-Fi work. We talked about a little bit of the other things, and I think I have five minutes, so I'm going to cruise a little bit fast. But the league will give us grades then, and this is not current. This is from years ago. I, I don't want to call out um, any teams, but, you know, we do pretty well in actually quite a few areas. Our goal is to always be in the top quartile. So um, we certainly have work to do every year, but this, again, this was from years ago, but the league sends out to every team in the NFL where they stack ranked on all those different categories, so it's kind of interesting. My favorite statistic is, from our internal research, is 89% of fans rated their game day experience at Lambeau Field as above average or excellent. So that's always great to hear, but that doesn't mean we can't improve. And 89% is not 100%, so we have a lot of work to do, and that's how we treat Although we like it, we know there's, we need to roll up our sleeves. So the biggest difference between marketing then and now, 
obviously I don't need to talk to you guys about this. You're well versed in all the areas of social, digital, and all of those platforms. That has really been great to increase our f audience footprint, to increase our audience depth and reach and retention. And I kind of like this slide, then and now what's old is new again. So we see a lot of resurgence of retro, so I thought that was a fun tie-in to uh, then and now. And then um, as we close up, what's the one constant between uh, the franchise over history? And for, for me and a lot of us internally, it's really the fan support. Early on in our history, we had a lot of support through business leaders to keep the team going. We had to pass the hat around City Stadium and Hagermeister Park so that we could build a fence so that we could charge for tickets when people came in. Um, we've had various stock sales throughout our history to be able to develop the land, increase the seating, stadium, uh, seating in the stadium, and add on the other business units that we have today. I think one of the things that separates us from other small market teams is the depth and reach that we have with fan bases all across the world. And I think um, one of the reasons I think that is is because there's more small towns in America and throughout the world than there are big cities. And I think that, that happens to be in our favor. I think also that we don't have technically an owner um, that is a figurehead that runs uh, the organization and that it's owned by the community and, and so forth. So that has not changed. So again, to review, these are, these are all the topics I wanted to touch on today and these were our areas in which we work. And I'm, I will leave it up for questions. I have three minutes for questions to keep us on time. And then one thing I did want to say, besides I love this photo, I don't know why, it's probably politically incorrect, but um, I uh, recommend every, to you if you want to get in sports marketing, the place to go is teamworkonline.com. That's where all the major sports uh, teams list their internships, and that is the best way to get into sports marketing. I will tell you that when I post an uh, internship, I get between 250 and 450 resumes in. So if you don't hear back from us or, or any other team, don't be discouraged. Just keep submitting. And um, there's a premium that you can pay to get uh, noticed and go above the ranks. We don't pay attention to that, so don't. <laughs> Don't spend the money, keep your money. Um, with that, we have still two minutes left for questions. If anybody has questions, you're supposed to line up the mic, I'm told. Do it quick, we've got a question. Someone's running. That's a good, that's a good thing. Quick answer too then. Well, can't guarantee quick answers. Okay. So one person behind you, then we get done. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm Sam, Sam Leepeck. I'm a marketing entrepreneurship and IT, or IT student here at Whitewater. My question is regards to uh, the new NFL social media policy regarding about five days ago the memo uh, video content. How does that affect your strategy and what um, goals are you doing to like move forward? You know, what do you, what's your plan of action with that? So, uh, thanks for the question. His question uh, for everybody was just, I don't know if they can hear it online, was how did the NFL social media policy change on what we're, change what we're doing? So it's unfortunate the league has uh, cracked down on the amount of video we can push out on social, the number of highlights. Um, we couldn't do animations in our social for a, for a certain time. They've since reversed that. Um, it's, it's not been great. Yeah. So we looked for constant fan engagement. And you know, you guys are huge users of social. Would you rather see you know, video than text all the time? Probably. But the reality is the league is allowing us to retweet and uh, push out their content, which is fine, and also, um, Let's say we don't have a video, but we could link things back to our site. So linking back to our site could therefore increase the numbers on the website, increase the number of ads we serve. So there's always a silver lining, and okay. you know this is a test, so we'll see how it goes. But great question. Thank you. Uh, with the uptick in recent daily fantasy sites and fantasy sites for fantasy football in general, how did the Green Bay Packers go about harnessing that newer market? Uh, the question was about fantasy and how do we harness that newer market. Well, the league dictates a lot of what we can do with fantasy. Um, they started a platform, I think it was three or four years ago, that was going to be embedded in any, every NFL team site. Um, and I don't think it did super fantastic, but we are 
um, graded on it from a research perspective and how frequent we show fantasy football on, during home games on our scoreboard. So um, the, we know it's a huge market. We haven't made that a bucket yet, but um, you know, partially because er, I don't know if it's specific to Packers fans or is it specific to all NFL fans. So, but thank right. you for the question. Thank you.